This is the Small Ruminant Famacha Certification and Parasite Management Workshop with Dr. Delia O'Brien from Virginia State University and Dr. Nikki Whitley from Fort Valley State University in Fort Valley, Georgia. All right, so we're going to record this session for future posting so that you will have access to it. I'm going to start. We'll take a break after about 45 minutes. We'll take a little stretch break, and then Dr. O'Brien is going to finish up. What we're going to talk about is parasites. We're going to look at parasite control in small ruminants. We're primarily going to focus on the internal parasites, which are those ones that live inside the animal. Although we do know that external parasites do plague small ruminants as well as others, but the internal parasites, especially that barber pole worm, and also a little bit tapeworms and really some coccidia problems we'll see in small ruminants. So those are the ones that are really going to cause us problems in sheep and goats. And sheep and goats are the most susceptible livestock to internal parasites. So it's very important for us to learn to help manage those. And again, the worst one is homunculus contortus or the barber pole worm. It sucks blood. So one of the main symptoms is that they will get anemic. And so if you see on the screen, these pale membranes, pale, pale mucous membranes, and the swelling or bottle jaw underneath the chin of the animal from the chin to the, the jaw here, that is called bottle jaw. And it's basically swelling from loss of protein. And I don't want you to get afraid if you see a young kid with a swelling here because that is more of a milk goiter. So the bottle jaw is from the chin to the jaw line and up underneath there. And that's a common symptom again of the barber pole worm. The things that make the barber pole worm so bad is that it has a short life cycle and it's a very prolific egg, egg producer. One female worm can lay 5,000 eggs a day. And that's just one worm. And they generally have way more than one worm. So lays a lot of eggs, infects pastures really bad. It also can go into a hypobiotic or arrested state. And anytime the weather is not conducive to larval development, that worm inside of the animal can basically go to sleep and wait until conditions are right for it to its offspring to survive. So that makes it pretty tricky. There have been research studies that have shown there are adults left in the animal after six months. And so they can live in an animal for up to six months. They can also survive on the pasture for a long time. So six months, if you stretch it, maybe up to a year, but six months is not surprising. Now, generally we say about three months, two in some weather, but up to six months. So it's a, it's a really bad little booger. The symptoms we talked about, this anemia, the bottle jaw, generally doesn't cause diarrhea unless it's mixed with other worms. And there are usually other worms in a mixed infection. Uh, although in the southeast, especially here in Georgia, we see a lot of infections that are 95 plus percent homunculus. It can cause apparently sudden death because they seem like they're okay and then they're just dead. It can cause weight loss and or loss of body condition because they basically are too tired, too lethargic. If you don't have blood, you're just tired all the time. And that's another symptom is if you really know your animals, you can tell, oh, they just don't feel well. They're not moving around very much. If you try to, if you try to work them to get them up, they, they may run and stumble. So they obviously won't be walking around grazing and they eventually go off feed or have anorexia and they can lose weight. There are other stomach worms or intestinal worms in sheep and goats. These are some of the examples. They're usually secondary infections, secondary to the homunculus. They obviously don't do the animal any good and, and can cause the scours, the diarrhea, and make the weight loss work, make them look like they're just poor doers. If you see a worm in sheep and goat feces, that's gonna be tapeworm. So tapeworms are the only ones we can see and you can treat tapeworm with Safeguard or Valbazin or any of the other Dazole drugs. It's the drugs that end in the word Dazole and we'll talk about those in a, a few minutes. But there have been some instances of resistance 
of tapeworm two, the white drenches, those dissolved drugs. So there are other tapeworm medications, specifically one called Prozaquantel, which is found in horse dewormers, such as Imetrin Gold, Paste, uh, Equimax, and Quest Plus. They come in little tubes for horses and are dosed by weight. There's uh, more information about tapeworms at this link at the bottom of your screen. And all of the resources that you're gonna need that are related to this are gonna be found at the wormx.info site. If you're going to use the horse dewormers, you're supposed to make sure you have a valid vet client relationship. Other worms include the liver fluke, which is mostly in Gulf Coast areas. It can cause anemia, so it may look like barbacool worm, can cause weight loss. And the treatment, again, Valbazin and Ivermec Plus are treatments for that. The deer worm is something that we will find in this area. We have had producers fighting meningeal worm or deer worm. And basically, this gets in the spinal cord of the, the sheep or the goat because it's not the primary host. The deer is the primary host and it'll get in the spinal cord and it'll it'll go up the spinal cord but it'll wherever it is in the spinal cord you'll start to see symptoms and a lot of that is stumbling especially on the rear and they can die from it. You can treat it with safeguard and anti-inflammatories with the treatment protocols listed down here at, at um, Cornell's blog, they have a really good fact sheet on meningeal worm or deer worm and gives you the exact treatment protocols that they found to be effective. What you can do to prevent this is try to keep deer out of your pastures or fence out low wet areas because it actually has an indirect life cycle where the deer interacts with a snail or slug and that completes the life cycle. So if the deer, if the sheep or the goat eats that infected slug off of the, the grass, then they're gonna end up getting it. So if you can get rid of the snails or slugs or keep the deer out, then you should be able to help control that. Lung worm is also a small ruminant worm that um, is transmitted in the feces, although you can't really see it if you try to do a fecal. It's usually, I tell people that it's taken care of if you're managing your other worms well. It can cause coughing and damage to the lungs, which can then cause pneumonia. Coccidia is an internal parasite, but it's not a worm. It's a single cell protozoa. It damages the lining of the small intestines. The small intestines are super important for absorbing nutrients. And so you're gonna see some poor performance in subclinical infestations. You're gonna see diarrhea that could be pretty nasty, smeared with blood or very, very mucousy. They can get anemic from the damage to the gut that the the parasites causing. They can, because of the diarrhea, they'll get dehydrated. It can cause death. And eventually, if you don't treat it, the damage can be permanent and they can show that ill thrift. So you really do need to control the, the clinical, when you see the clinical symptoms, you need to try to control coccidiosis. Uh, it is more common in weaned, young weaned animals, animals under stress, but especially those young animals uh, that may be in um, areas that you're trying to, to feed them. So prevention, you want to use good sanitation, keep your feeders clean, keep your waters clean, don't overstock because um, you can get it out on pasture, like underneath trees when they're grazing in the shade and hanging around under trees, those kind of things. You can use menensin or dequinate, so remensin or decox for prevention of coccidiosis. You can use amprolium or chorid in the water. You want to check the label because some of these may be dangerous to horses or donkeys, so you don't want to have it in your feed if you're feeding your other livestock if it could hurt them. You can use cord as a treatment or sulfa drugs such as albon or dimethox which are by prescription only. 
For supportive therapy, um, super important if they have coccidiosis to make sure you give some supportive therapy. And another treatment is using Cerisa lispidiza pellets. So Cerisa lispidiza is a forage legume that has condensed tannins in it that have been shown to reduce the incidence of coccidiosis and reduce fecal parasite egg count in sheep and goats. If you look at the Merck Veterinary Manual online, you can see that they give doses of these two drugs, um, Toltrazuril or Dichlorazil. And also, I had a producer who had some pretty strong resistance on his farm to sulfur drugs for Coxy. Cora didn't work for him anymore. The sulfur drugs didn't work anymore because of this on-farm resistance, not a genetic resistance, but this on-farm resistance that he had. And his vet gave him the EPM drug Marquee. And there's also another EPM drug that's made of a similar drug that Merck Veterinary Manual recommends. So possible treatments there that you would wanna work with your vet to try to deal with coccidiosis. So this is the life cycle of stomach worms. This is what we call a direct life cycle. And a lot of our stomach worms will have this and homuncus is the one that we're gonna be talking about right now. So what happens is the, the worms actually breed inside the animal. And they will lay their eggs in the intestinal tract, goes out in the feces, and the eggs will hatch within the fecal pellets. They require warmth and humidity to hatch to that first stage larva, which is gonna happen inside again the fecal pellet. They'll develop to L1 or L2 and L2 in that pellet. If the conditions aren't right, the eggs can die off in five to 21 days, depending on the species of the worm. But if they develop, on further, the L3 is the infective stage. And that L3 is gonna come out and it's gonna be on the pasture. And what's gonna happen is that it is going to migrate outside of the fecal pellet and splash up on the grass or migrate up the grass in dew droplets. And that is how the animal gets infected. It's gonna eat the grass that has the dew droplets with the worms in it and then the life cycle is gonna start back over. Development to that L3 or infective stage takes uh, four to 10 days. It can happen as little as three days in homuncus. It depends again on how, what the environment is like. From L3, that infective stage back to the, to the worm laying eggs is about 18 to 21 days. Again, that infective larva can live on the pasture two to three months in the summer, six months in the winter, and occasionally you can see them live over a year in the right conditions. In a really hot, dry summer, we don't have as big a problem with homuncus. So after you would deworm, any of the eggs from the existing worms take about three to four days before all of those are passed out um, of the animal. So basically in 21 to 30 days, they become infected and are passing worms. So in the past, what we've used to control parasites is a drug. And what we look for in a drug that is effective is that it's selectively toxic to the parasite but doesn't kill the host. It can be broad spectrum, meaning it kills a bunch of different types of worms, or it can be targeted for a specific type of worm, like we were talking about quasi-quantel killing tapeworm. And it can contain either a single drug or a multiple drug in other countries. And in the US, we do not have any combination or multiple drug dewormers available. The drugs we have available belong to one of three different groups. And group one is what I call the dazoles because the chemical name is gonna end in D-A-Z-O-L-E, dazole. And so the official name is benzimidazole. 
That is gonna include Fimbendazole, which is Safeguard or Panicure, uh, Valbazin, Sinanthic. We're gonna have those white drenches are in that class. Then in group two or class two, I call it the ectin class because the chemical name ends in ectin. These are officially our macrocyclic lactones. And they include Ivamec, Dekta, uh, Doramectin, or Dectamax, Aprinomectin, um, Moxidectin. And Moxidectin is available, all of these drugs are actually available in different forms, including for horses. For example, Safeguard is available, Panicure is available, is a horse dewormer in the small tube, uh, Quest is available, and then for the nicotinic group, which is group three, Strongid is available in a tube for a horse dewormer. The tube is smaller, so people work with their vets to use just the, the small tube if they only have one or two animals instead of having to buy a big container of dewormer. The nicotinic group is actually the one that for a long time was the most effective. We'll see in a few minutes that we're having increased resistance of um, the worms to the drugs in this class, including levamisole, which is Prohibit and Levamed. The Morantel and Pyrantel Although the pyrantel is available in a horse dewormer and as a feed through, the morantel is generally only found that I know of in a feed through formulation. And we don't generally rec recommend using feed throughs because if you're using a feed through, they may not all get their amount, they may fight and not get enough. And that is going to, they don't get enough in there, they're not gonna get rid of all the worms and the worms that are there are more likely to become immune to that dewormer or resistant to the dewormer. Also, an animal that's really wormy generally is anorexic or they don't eat, they're all feed. So if they're all feed, the ones that really need it are probably not gonna get it. So we don't generally recommend feed throughs. So I talked a little bit about dewormer resistance already. And basically that is when the worms survive the drug treatment at the prescribed dose, at the correct dose. And you can find those, those recommended doses at wormx.info. There is a deworming chart for sheep, goats, and camelids. When the treatment is given, if the worms are resistant, they're not gonna die. So they're going to live through the treatment. And then they are going to pass on worms that are, or eggs that are also resistant, and they're gonna breed with other resistant worms and make your, make your whole population eventually will become resistant. Now we know that resistance is really, it's just gonna happen because there were genes around that helped confer resistance before there were even drugs, but drugs make it worse. So we want to try to slow that resistance from happening. We know that, especially in the South, worms have developed resistance to all the dewormers and all classes of dewormers. And even countries where there are new drugs, within two years, there was already resistance to the worms. So if you're not careful, if you don't use drugs properly, it's gonna, in, it's gonna cause resistance to happen faster. So we, we classify resistance as if more than 5% of the worms survive the treatment or you can't really tell how many worms are in an animal while they're alive. So we can look at fecal egg count and we say that if the fecal egg count reduction is 95% or less than 95%, then you're starting to see resistance. And we say severe resistant at less than 60% egg reduction. The problem with, of that is that you won't necessarily see any problems until you get to 50% of the worms. So if you only kill 50% of the worms, you may think you're fine. You don't see any problems with resistance because you can have reduced performance up to that 50% maybe a reduction of performance that you don't even see when you start looking up towards this end. So 50% worm removal is pretty
pretty bad resistance. And generally, once you have resistance, you can't go back, although there is some information that at least for levamisol, you may be able to turn it around with some management strategies. When we look at dewormer resistance in the US, 2007 to 2009, there was a study done at University of Georgia comparing mid-Atlantic and farms in the Southeast region. These farms showed very high resistance to benzimidazoles. That's the dissolved family like Safeguard and Valbazin, Synanthic, Panacure, those drugs, and high resistance to ivermectin. Cydectin or moxidectin resistance and levamisol resistance, and again, levamisol is like the prohibits and the levamids, that resistance was fairly low, but still increasing. When you look just a few short years later, 10 years or so later, we have looking at sheep farms in the Mid-Atlantic, Maryland in the South, Virginia and Georgia. We look at resistance of 100% to the benzimidazoles, almost 100% for the ivermectin drugs, and really high levels of resistance to cydectin, and levamisol in Virginia and Georgia. So the more that we use the drugs and the higher, worst problem we have with worms, the more resistance we're gonna see happen if we don't manage those dewormers properly. To look at dewormer resistance, and it's recommended that you know what worms, worm, dewormers work on your farm. And to do that, you have to do a dewormer resistance test. The simplest one that's an on-farm test that can be done is fecal egg count reduction test. So you do a fecal egg count, you deworm them 10 to 14 days later, you do another fecal egg count. You have to have more animals to test than if you just do a drench rot test, but we'll talk about that in a minute. You have to have like 10 to 15 per dewormer that have at least 250 eggs per gram to start with because you have to be able to see a reduction. But you can at least pull those samples if you do it correctly and you can get with us about the method to do this if you wanted to do a fecal egg count reduction test so that it's cheaper. If you do a pooled sample, it's cheaper to do. And this is gonna give you percent resistance by looking at percent reduction in the fecal egg count. And again, cost will vary if you get if you get a veterinarian to help you, but you can actually learn to do fecal egg counts yourself and you can get with us about the method to do this if you wanted to do a fecal egg count reduction test. The other way to look at dewormer resistance is a larval development assay. That's called the drench rot test and only the University of Georgia does it in the US. It's $500, but you send a pool poop sample in and you get the results back. And it, checks all three classes of drugs plus cydectin. So it also will give you information on the species of worms that you have, which you can only get through larval culture. You can't look at the eggs under the microscope until the species for most of them, um, most of those strongyles, including homunculus. So you, you have to get a, a culture done, not specifically this one, but this one will tell you the worm species, the percentages of each of those species, and the resistance in them if there's enough there to test. A worm culture costs a lot less than $500, although if you look at the south or most regions where it gets warm and humid and your animals have some anemia and they're on infected pastures, you pretty much know you have a high concentration of homunculus. And if you can manage homunculus, you're generally managing the others. We wanna to try to keep our drugs working as well as we can. And these are some of the things that we wanna do. We wanna make sure we're given the correct dose. You wanna make sure that you either weigh them before treatment, if you have a, a large group, if they're about the same age and size, pick the biggest one, weigh it, and, and deworm for that, as long as you're being careful with not overdosing, especially if you're using prohibit. 
or you can maybe use a dairy goat whey tape if your animals have a little bit more dairy character or if you have dairy goats. You wanna make sure you're drenching correctly. So you wanna use a drenching gun and you want to put it over the tongue towards the back of the mouth to make sure that they are getting it all. You wanna, you can restrict feed for 24 hours. You don't have to, and you certainly don't wanna do this if the animal is in bad shape because the last thing you need to do is restrict feed them. Um, they need all of the food that they can get, all of the nutrition they can get. So as long as they're not in bad shape, you can do this restriction, feed restrict them maybe overnight at least, and it makes the drugs a little more effective. You could dose 12 hours apart, two doses 12 hours apart, and if you are using levamisol, you would wait for 24 hours. And again, here's a link for the dewormer charts, dosing charts. Goats need more, generally one and a half to two times the dose on the label. So we want to make sure that we're using dewormers that work because if it stops working, then you get less and less benefit as, as, it, as resistance and of the worms to that dewormer increases. So again, if you're only killing about 50% of the worms, basically that drug's not useful as a dewormer anymore. We know that rotating dewormers is not actually gonna prevent resistance. As a matter of fact, it could make it worse and it's no longer recommended. And current guidelines indicate that dewormers should be used together at the same time in combination, one after the other. You're really not supposed to mix them. And that is gonna help keep dewormer resistance from happening as fast. We do not have combination drugs, again, in the US. There is some research done on these drugs in New Zealand that shows that it is best to use combination drugs, but we wanna make sure we're using best management practices. So we're going to, we wanna make sure that we're only deworming those that need it, or you're gonna get in trouble with resistance to your combinations if you try to deworm everybody all at the same time. And Dr. O'Brien will talk more about those kind of things, but you wanna treat only the ones that need it. And if you do this, there's some research that says, especially with drugs like levamisol, there may be a reversion back towards susceptibility on some farms, but likely would take quite a long time. This just shows how you can use the dewormers and how it increases efficacy of the drug. So if you use two drugs in combination and they're both only 80% effective, the combination is 96%. If you use all three and they're 80%, then you get up to 99.2. So even with drugs that are already 90% effective used in combination, you can get way up to 99 to 99.9% .9 efficacy. It drops off, of course, as your single drugs become less effective, but you can still get up to 93.6% with drugs that are only 60% effective. The key to this is hoping that you have a drug, at least one that's already still highly effective, so you can make sure you save that one by using it in combination, because you will kill any of the worms that it left when you treated it with the other two drugs that you're using in combination. So this gives an example, this chart gives an example. If the dewormer is 99% effective and again you use just it by itself, but if you use two then you get 99.99 and that's a hundredfold different in the, in the number of resistant worms that survived. So obviously more effective if you have a highly effective dewormer, but it's gonna be effective in reducing the number of worms that are left that live through the combination treatments when you use two or more drugs in combination. Again, we only have three available in the US so three drugs in combination is the most that you really would use. If you use combination treatments, again, you use the full dose, 
whatever it calls for based on an accurate weight and again one right after the other not mixing them you can give the most potent drug from each anthelmintic group is what is recommended and you want to make sure you use the withdrawal period for the one with the longest withdrawal time and this gives an example so these are the strongest drugs in each of the drug classes and the doses that would be used based on the dosing chart um, except for prohibit it depends on which dilution that you use and if you were to use these 17 days meat withdrawal would be the highest, so that's what you would use. So you would always use the highest withdrawal period. And of course, you wanna read the labels and make sure that you're not using drugs such as valbazin um, in the first 30 days of pregnancy. We do not wanna give combination treatments to all animals in a management group. So we, we know that we should only deworm those that need to be treated. We want to do that selective treatment and that's to to maintain our refugia or the number of worms that haven't been exposed to a dewormer. And we're going to selectively treat by doing things like FAMACHA, which is the eyelid color scoring system. We want to use the five point check, which actually includes FAMACHA and other indicators of worms. And then we can also use a performance indicator, like did they gain weight from the last time we, we checked? Is milk production going down, even though it's they're still at peak production, those kind of things. The reason we only wanna treat those that are needing it is because if you treat all of them, they're gonna get resistant to all of the drugs and you won't have any drugs left. And believe it or not, in our research, um, that I showed the chart for, Georgia had farms that had no drugs individually treated that worked. And I worked with one farmer that eventually had resistance to all three in combination. So if you're not careful, you don't manage your animals to help prevent or manage parasites, you can get into serious trouble. And you want to make sure that, again, you always work with a veterinarian. If you have animals that are really parasitized, like a four or a five FAMACHA, then we would want to give them supportive therapy. Remove them from the infected environment. Um, feed high-protein feeds or forages. I tell people sometimes give them their favorite stuff to try to get them back on feed. Maybe consider powdered protein supplements. You could give vitamin and mineral supplements, red cell, iron power, perctone. Again, following label guidelines or working with your veterinarian to see what if they recommend that or not. Electrolytes, um, supplemental energy sources. If you don't have any animal electrolytes on hand, you can use human electrolytes like Gatorade, Powerade, or Pedialyte. But B vitamins are not gonna hurt anything. You can give a fortified vitamin B complex, which is high in thiamine. Injectable iron has been tried before. Uh, vitamin K, which helps with blood clot. Again, nothing, really shown that about vitamin K, but I've heard producers say their vet recommended it. So you can try kaopectate or the pink stuff that you can buy for animals called kale and pectin or Pepto-Bismol. It's all kind of the same thing to help slow their diarrhea. It doesn't treat anything. It just slows down the diarrhea and can, can even stop it. It is pretty high doses uh, for ruminants in order to, to slow that down, but it has been shown to work. And then probiotics might be used to help stimulate their appetite, get them back on feed. Overall, what we're trying to do is, is not create a parasite-free animal because they're just gonna get parasites. Sheep and goats, they just do. And what we're trying to do is prevent clinical disease and prevent our production losses that can cost us money. All right, so time for our stretch break. The second part of our presentation will be by Dr. Delia O'Brien. 
So part two of the presentation tonight is going to present to you a toolbox of, of things that you can do to, to help to control parasites on your farm. So non-chemical approaches, of course, are going to include your host immunity and genetic selection, pasture and grazing management, nutrition, herbal dewormers such as garlic, ginger, pumpkin seeds, and their other I guess combination herbal products that are out there, copper oxide wire particles, the use of condensed tannins in, in parasite control, the fungus, Dudentonia flagrans, and then the chemical approach is gonna, gonna be on exactly what is for matcha. And we'll also talk about the five point check and how to use both of these tools in targeted selective treatment so that we're not deworming every animal on our farm. We're deworming simply based on clinical symptoms. There are some animals on our farms that are going to be more susceptible to parasites than others. And these are going to include your kids and lambs. They have a naive immune system. And so this just makes them more susceptible to parasites. As they get older and they're exposed to parasites, they'll develop a resistance, natural resistance to parasites. In, in lambs, this is probably about six months of age or so. And in goats, this tends to be a little bit later. Some of them gain this resistance by about a year, a year old. And as you're aware, some animals just never really gain that strong enough resistance. This group also includes our periparturoint females. As you know, right around the time of lambing or kidding, there is a drop in a female's immune response, and this makes her highly susceptible to internal parasites. Older animals on your farm are going to be more susceptible. Your less susceptible animals are going to be your bucks, any open does. They're old enough that they should have a natural resistance to parasites. And so these should be less susceptible to worms and of course our pets. We usually keep our pets maybe on a dry lot situation and they get fed optimally. And so they're usually spoiled anyway. So usually they're, they're not as exposed or as susceptible to parasites. We know that the ability to regulate worm is under genetic control. It is a moderately heritable trait, 20 to 40%. So you can use fecal egg counts and you could select for resistance in your animals. I'm sure most of you have heard the terms resistance and resilience thrown around when it comes to internal parasites. Well, resistance is the ability of the animal to limit infection, all right? So they consistently demonstrate low fecal egg counts. They could be placed on pastures where that's highly infested, but for some reason, those parasites don't take hold and they just pass right through when this animal doesn't get infected, they don't show any symptoms. And this is mainly assessed by their fecal egg counts. An animal that's resistant will have consistently low fecal egg counts. Resilience, on the other hand, is the ability of the animal to withstand infection. All right, so these animals tend to be wormy, but they show no signs of that. So they barely show, show any clinical symptoms. So if you compare them to an animal that's resistant, resistant, this is an animal that you that is on a pasture that's heavily infested. It picks up these worms, it has a high load, but still it's not showing any symptoms. All right, this is typically assessed by FAMACHA scores and hematocrits, and hematocrits just measures, it measures the, the, the level of red blood cells, so it's an indication of anemia, just like the FAMACHA is an indirect um, measure of anemia. But a resilient animal will still contribute a lot of eggs on your pasture. So we do know that there's some breeds that are more resistant than others out there. And within any breed, there are individual animals that are more resistant as well. You pr you've probably heard that here sheep are more resistant than wool sheep. You've probably heard that boar goats are not that resistant to parasites. But I want to caution you too that within every breed, there are individuals that are more naturally resistant than others. Because it's a heritable trait, Resistant dams and sires will most likely produce resistant offspring, right? So if you are using tools such as your FAMACHA and you're going through a selectively deworming and you're taking good records on who, who you have to deworm multiple times per year, um, if you're taking fecal egg counts and you're looking to see which animals in your herd have the lowest 
fecal egg counts. And if you select based on this, then you can go a far way in helping to control parasites on your farm. It's even more important when you consider the sire or the male. The male contributes 50% of the flock genetics on most farms. And so you should already know that you should be selecting a male that's more resistant and you can more resistant and you could do this by purchasing males from um, performance test or if you're selecting any males from your own herd or your flock, then you've at least monitored their fecal egg counts to determine that they had multiple fecal egg counts that were pretty low and that they're resistant and will pass this resistant traits onto, onto their offspring. Um, it is also crucial to remember your 70, your 70, 30 percent rule. That is 30 percent of the flock is going to shed 70 percent of the worm eggs in your flock or herd. So again, no matter what studies that we've done, we've always shown that there is a group of animals, they're responsible for passing most of those worms onto your pasture. So if you can identify that 30%, you can focus the worming on them, or you could call those animals, then you'll go a far way into reducing pasture contamination. Um, pasture management should be the primary tool that producers use. All right, so the genetic selection that we talked about before, that takes a little bit more time going through, monitoring your FAMACHA scores, taking fecal samples to monitor fecal egg count so you could select for more resistant animals. If you're using FAMACHA scores, then you could be selecting for resilient animals too. But using that tool to, to select for um, resistant animals is, is highly recommended. And then using pasture management too, um, that should be one of the primary tools that you're using. Very few worm larvae get higher than two to four inches from the ground on a blade of grass. So if you can prevent animals from grazing below this height, that reduces the number of larvae that they will ingest and you will reduce your, their infection. Okay, so if you keep your pastures above a certain height, even from, if you're thinking about a manure pile, even from that pile, if those eggs were passed in a specific manure pile, that larvae can only migrate approximately 12 inches away from that pile. So they really don't travel too far. Good pasture management practices for worm control are gonna include rotational grazing. It is important in limiting parasite infections. And I know a lot of producers, or many producers probably don't have enough land to divide them up into, into your pastures, into paddocks, so you can do an effective rotation. But if you do have sufficient land, then this is something that you should be doing. Dr. Whitley mentioned before that it takes about four to five days from the time that manure is passed from an animal for that egg to hatch and become an infective larvae. So it is typically recommended that you move animals every four to five days in order to prevent them from getting reinfected with their own parasites. I hope that makes sense. It takes about four to five days. So if they're on there any longer, then they can ingest those parasites that they themselves have passed. So a lot of rotational grazing that you'll see or recommendations out there will recommend that they be moved. And sometimes it's even shorter than that, every, every three days or, or, or less than every five days so that you avoid them reinfecting themselves. When is it safe to return animals to a pasture after they've been removed from it? It's gonna depend on a number of factors, such as the worm species, the temperature, moisture, the forage type. But generally, when barber pole predominates, rest in pastures for approximately 60 days has shown good results. And this, as I said before, this depends. It, it, it depends on the time of year. It could be shorter. It could be longer. I believe Dr. Whitley mentioned that these L3 larvae, they actually are not feeding. They're depending on, on their own body reserves to survive. So the hotter it is, like in the warm, warm months um, in summer, they'll be more active. They're moving around more. They're more active. So they'll run through these reserves a lot faster and die off faster. When you compare that to winter months when they move less, 
and they can conserve some of their energy so they take longer to die. So sometimes they can take anywhere, they can take up to a year or more to die. So a pasture is generally considered clean in a year. However, during the parasite season, it's considered to go from a high level of infestation to a low level of infestation within 60 days. Other things that you could do under pasture management to help to control worms, um, I mentioned before, managing that grazing height. If you monitor your paddocks and make sure that they're not grazing too low, and I know this is hard to do, especially with sheep, because they find that lowest part on that, on that pasture to graze. And a lot of times, even so, they're always grazing around the feeders or around the waterers in the summer, and those areas tend to be lower, and it's very hard to manage that way. But if you can manage your grazing height so that they're not, they're not grazing low enough where those larvae are, then you're helping to control parasites. Maintaining low stocking rates. You don't want to overcrowd or overstock a pasture. The more animals you have in a small area, the more manure they're passing, the more eggs that are going to be on that pasture, the more they're going to develop into L3 larvae and they'll ingest it and that cycle continues and you're, you're increasing the, that exposure to the larvae. Multi-species grazing is a tool that you can use to to reduce the number of larvae on pasture. Other species such as cattle and horses, they don't share the same parasites as sheep and goats or even camelids. And so if you let them graze areas that the sheep and goats are grazing, they serve as vacuums and they help to clean up that pasture of those larvae so that when you bring your sheep and goats back onto that pasture, the number of larvae has been reduced. Access to browse and bioactive forages. The higher you let these animals graze or if they're browsing, then the less exposure they'll have to larvae. That's very important. That's critical in the control of parasite infections. Using bioactive forages such as Cerise lespedeza, and I'll talk a bit more about this, plants that contain condensed tannins have been shown to be effective in controlling internal parasites. So if you can have Give them access to browse, active, um, access to bioactive forages. This will help in parasite control. The use of annuals, harvesting hay, increasing forage quality, a good nutrition goes a long way in helping them to deal better with parasite infections. So all these are tools that you should be, should be using. Good nutrition cannot be overstated. The first thing that most of us should be doing on our farms is keeping good sanitary conditions and feeding correctly. I've been on farms where they're doing forage-based or pasture-based um, production system, and there's no grass out there, and there's no supplement. If these animals aren't fed adequately, they will not be able to deal well with a parasite infection. All right, so good nutrition, it's in our control. And so we, we should be doing that at least to help to control parasites. And good nutrition is important because protein helps um, in rebuilding tissue that's been damaged by the worms. And minerals such as copper and zinc, they help to support a good immune system. So first, good nutrition helps to promote immunity to worms. Research has shown also that when you increase the protein level in use six weeks prior to lambing, they have significantly less fecal egg counts. All right, so that helps with that peripartuate fecal egg count that we mentioned before, where there's a lapse in their immune system and fecal egg counts go up around that time of lambing or kidding. Supplementing your lambs has also been shown to increase gains and hematocrits. Again, increased hematocrits means that they're not anemic, and so good nutrition goes a long way in helping to, to, to build that immunity. Legumes also provide more protein. So if you can provide access to legumes, that will help to control your parasite, internal parasites on your farm. And of course, zero grazing. If you raise your animals in dry lots, they will have less parasite issues. And I know a lot of producers, I'm from the Caribbean, if you can't tell already by my accent, and I know there are a lot of producers in Jamaica where I'm from that do zero grazing, where they basically cut fresh, they, they just cut fresh forage and bring it to the animals so they're not out, out grazing. And my mother raises goats right now too, 
and she just lets them go out and forage daily. We're fortunate that we don't have many neighbors around, and so they go out, they forage, and they basically forage in a different area every day, and she has goats. So they're natural browsers, so they don't have many parasite issues. So we have to consider all of this when we're thinking about para effective parasite control. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that herbal dewormers work. However, there's lack of scientific support. And even when there's been research supporting that these herbal dewormers are effective, there's inconsistent data that's out there. And so some, sometimes folk will, folks will ask me, so do you ever recommend herbal dewormers? And I will, I will say to them, basically, I, I'm not saying don't use herbal dewormers. If you believe it's working in your on your farm, in your system, it gives you peace of mind, then go ahead. But there's really lack of scientific um, evidence that these herbal dewormers really are effective in controlling internal parasites. I will mention that when I was at Delaware, we did a study with pumpkin seeds and we made a pumpkin seed drench out of a recipe that was, that was out of Canada. And we had our or pumpkin seed group that was drenched and we had a control group that was drenched and I had to remove animals out of the control group because they showed clinical signs of being infected with parasites. However, the pumpkin seed group did not, their FOMACHA scores were good, they didn't have any diarrhea or anything, they were still gaining weight, However, when I looked at their fecal egg counts, their fecal egg, egg counts were just as high as the control group. So we found that the pumpkin seeds helped, helped these animals to deal better with that parasite infection. But it, again, these herbal dewormers are not treatments. They might help because pumpkin seeds are rich in protein, so they might help these animals to deal better, again, with, with internal parasites. The herbal dewormers that I mentioned before, they have not been tested consistently. I tested a lot of natural dewormers or natural products in my lab when I was at Delaware. And I know of other researchers that were testing some of these same products. However, there was no consistency in testing these products. I would use a, dr a drench. Somebody else might have been trying to incorporate the pumpkin seeds into a pellet. Someone else was trying to use a garlic oil while I was feeding fresh garlic. And so that might be a reason why some of the data that's been coming out has not been, um, been consistent. However, copper oxide wire particles and Cerecia lespedeza, these two natural products that I'm going to talk about next, these have been studied in different areas of the U.S. They've been studied in different types of animals, in young animals, older animals, lactating animals. And these have been shown to be effective in all. So copper, as I said before, is important for immune function. Copper oxide wire particle is available commercially to help to alleviate copper deficiency in ruminant livestock. So they're tiny particles, and you can see from the diagram there, um, they're tiny particles of copper oxide, and they're a slow release. So if you think about the copper in these compared to, say, copper in like copper sulfate, these are poorly absorbed for, form of copper. So they don't lead to as, as much toxicity issues as you would see in feeding say copper copper sulfate to your animals. A low dose of these copper oxide wire particles, a low dose, so 0 0.5 to 1 gram in kids or lambs, and a higher dose, 1 to 2 grams in user dose, has been shown to be effective in controlling the barber pole worm in both sheep and goats. And as I said before, this has been tested across the U.S. in, in, in different states, and it has been tested in across all production stages in young animals and older animals. Therefore, copper oxide wire particle particles can be included in an integrated um, an integrated parasite control program on your farm. There could be possible toxicity issues in sheep. As most of you are aware, um, sheep are sensitive to, to, to copper, are more sensitive than goats, and so there could be possible toxicity issues in sheep. And we generally recommend that before using, you assess the copper status of your flock or herd. We recommend, but you don't have to. You could, if you're going to include um, copper oxide wire particles in your parasite control um, 
regimen, then we do recommend that routinely when an animal dies or you get an animal slaughtered at the processing facility that maybe you collect their, their liver and get a mineral panel done just to monitor and know what that copper, copper status is so that you are aware that you know, it makes you more comfortable, especially when you're dealing with sheep. The boluses that are available, they have cattle and goat boluses. Um, these can be repackaged into smaller sizes so that you don't have to be that worried about toxicity issues and you don't have to be administering more than is needed, all right, for treatment of internal parasites. Um, one of our colleagues did a study um, in Arkansas looking at combining copper oxide wire particles um, with a dewormer to see if it would increase the efficacy of that dewormer. And as you can see, the copper oxide wire particle, the albendazole by itself, didn't reduce fecal egg counts by much, but combined, it was 99% effective. So there's research out there indicating that even with parasites that are resistant to a particular drug, you can combine that dewormer with copper oxide wire particle and it will be more um, effective in, in killing those worms. So Dr. Whitley mentioned before combination treatments. So combination treatments don't have to be a combination of your chemical dewormers alone. It could be a combination of a chemical dewormer with copper oxide wire particle for treatment of internal parasites. So plants containing condensed tannins, such as Cerisia lespedeza, they've been shown to reduce indicators of worm infection in sheep and goats. Cerisia lespedeza, specifically the AU grazer variety has been shown to reduce fecal egg count when it's grazed, when it's fed as a hay, when you feed it as a pellet, or when you provide it as a silage. It's been shown to be effective in reducing um, fecal egg counts. It's effective against the barber pole worm, and it's also effective against coccidia. So if coccidia, if you have issues in your young animals at weaning with coccidiosis, then you could start feeding Cerisia lespedeza pellets a few weeks before weaning through a few weeks after weaning, and this will help to eliminate coccidiosis issues. Research has found, however, that long-term grazing or feeding of Cerisia lespedeza can lead to reduced weight gains. And they've also noticed that some minerals have been reduced if long-term feeding is done. However, supplemental feeding of pellets for eight weeks has been shown to provide a short-term boost in health and productivity. So you'd want to watch how long you're grazing or feeding Cerisia lespedeza for just so you don't start seeing any negative negative effects. Um, I know that there's some producers who who mix it in with their 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 grain and feed that, and there's some producers who do it year round with no negative effects. So another natural product that's been found to be effective in controlling internal parasites in sheep and goats, as well as other species, cattle and horses, I believe is Duddingtonia flagrans, and that's a nematode trapping fungi. So this is a naturally occurring fungus. So when it's put in their feed and they ingest it, it survives passage through their digestive tract, right? And then when it's passed out in the manure, it germinates and spreads on fresh feces and basically traps these nematodes so they cannot develop. It restricts their development on pasture. In order for it to be effective, it has to be fed every day to have a continuous effect. And I believe the, the label says for at least um, 60 days, it is effective against larvae of success, susceptible and resistant parasites. So you could feed it to animals that have been dewormed to capture and prevent those resistant worms from developing. It is not effective, however, on, in larvae that are already on the pasture or on any other parasites. And the reason why this fungus works so well is if you think about it, there, when you think about the worm population, when you think about your animals and them being on pasture and you think about the worm population out there on that paddock or on that pasture, 10% of the worm population is gonna be inside that animal, while 90% is gonna be located 
on the pasture. So when you deworm the animal, say you're using an effective drug and that's 95% effective, that only results in a 9.5% reduction. If you use a product that is 70% effective in reducing the, the worms that are on the pasture, that results in a 63% worm reduction. So I hope you're able to, to see if we incorporate this fungus and we're reducing the larvae that are on that pasture, then that's a more effective way um, to be controlling parasites. So previously, this fungus has been around forever and there's been research done for a number of decades now. Um, we've known that it is effective, but previously doses of up to 1 million spores per kilogram were used in kids and lambs to be effective. However, they developed a new strain in Australia and it provides control at a dose of 30,000 spores per kilogram of body weight. It's sold under the trade names of Biowormer and Livamol with biowormer. In the past, biowormer was limited to veterinarians, feed mills, and premixers, but it's now available to all. A 15 pound pail of, of the livermore with biowormer that comes ready to feed costs about $89.50. The biowormer, which is straight biowormer where you'd have to top dress or mix it into their feed or mineral, that can be fed at a rate of 0.1 ounce per 100 pound. And again, this helps to reduce, it's not a treatment for the worms that are inside the animal. This helps to prevent those eggs that, th those larvae that develop, that are on pasture from developing in that manure. So it is recommended that biowormer be fed daily as either a top dress or mixed into the feed or mineral supplement. It is sold through Premier One. And if you check out the website, you'll see that a lot of the reviews, they're complaining about the cost of this product. And in addition to the cost, it's, it's ba basically how best to administer it to your animals. We do recommend that you feed bioworma during periods when conditions are conducive to larval development and transmission onto pasture. So if you're thinking about when to feed it, it might be good to feed it to your female to counteract that periparturant rise in fecal egg counts or feed it for a couple of weeks before kidding and lambing or into a couple of weeks during lactation because this are, these are times when those females, their immunity is suppressed and they could be passing a lot of eggs onto the pasture. In addition to them, other animals that are susceptible, such as your young animals, your weaned animals, your growing animals, those are the animals that you might want to feed it to and not to the entire flock if you're thinking about cost efficiency. So um, recommendations are also to deworm all animals prior to feeding bioworma and then move these animals to a pasture with low pasture infestation. And in order to feed, in order to keep worm loads low, it is recommended that bioworm um, or liver mill be fed for at least 60 days to, to these animals. I'm sure many of you have heard other producers talk that diatomaceous earth is effective. It kills all internal parasites. And there might even be claims on some websites for some of these products. As a deworming control, it is often mixed in with a mineral supplement or in the, in, in the feed on most farms. But research has shown that even though it has insecticidal properties, it helps to keep those, those pests, external pests down. But Control studies have found that it is not effective in controlling internal parasites in, in your sheep or goats. Um, some of you have probably heard that there's a vaccine out there available, Barbervax. It's a barber pole worm vaccine. It is only marketed in Australia for sheep. Um, we were told recently that it might, it, it, it'll probably, not recently, but years ago, we were told it would never be available in the US because it's too costly to make and supply would be limited. However, due to the increased resistant issues that we're seeing in the US, we think um, there has been talk about bringing it here to the US. And so this is, an, this is a vaccine that's given to your young animals and it's multiple doses so that they, they can build up an immunity to, to the barber pole worm. 
moving into to the most, I guess the most important part of this presentation, everything is important, but tying this all in, all right, everything that we've talked about. To be effective in controlling parasites on your farm, you're gonna have to use a combination of these tools that we've, we've talked about and try to do targeted selective treatment. So this simply means that we're deworming only those animals that require treatment. All right, so it helps in identifying when we use tools, there are two tools developed, the FOMACHA and the five point check. Those two tools have been developed to help us identify animals that, that need to be dewormed or not. All right, so we can sort them, deworm those that are showing clinical symptoms, and we leave the others alone. So it helps to manage drug resistance and decrease our deworming frequency, and it slows down resistance by basically leaving some, some worms in refuge from the drug. If you consider this diagram right here, and on one side we have, it's the same animals, same three animals, and you have these animals that have susceptible worms and resistant worms inside their guts. If you deworm all these animals, all three of them, right, with an effective dewormer, the only worms that are going to, the, the, only the resistant worms are going to survive. So those worms are going to continue laying eggs. They're going to, those eggs are going to hatch. They're going to develop into larvae, be ingested again. And you're just making the whole issue of resistant wor resistance worse. If we take those three animals, they have resistant and susceptible worms inside and we deworm the base only on symptoms, only on symptoms. And one of those three needs to be dewormed then we've left those susceptible worms in the other two in refuge from that drug. So we're basically diluting the number of resistant eggs or resistant larvae that are on that pasture with susceptible worms as well. So any animals that are grazing or come through grazing will be able to pick up some susceptible worms as well. I hope that makes sense um, to most of you. So. The FOMACHA system, and I really need to update this picture, that was the huge FOMACHA card that, was, that we had when the FOMACHA system just came out. But the FOMACHA system was developed in South Africa in response to dewormer resistance in these worms. And it has been validated for sheep, goats, and camelids. All right, it's a system that assesses the barbopole worm infection, because remember, it rates the level on, of anemia on a scale of one to five, with one being bright red and healthy and five being white pale at death's door. So it rates that level of anemia in an animal. And anemia, as we know, is a symptom of the barbopole worm infection. So it's specifically designed to assess barbopole worm infection. So it doesn't consider the other worms that are out there. So the FOMACHA, these are the clinical categories, one to five, and that's the eyelid categor um, category that goes with, with each, and it, it correlates to a specific Paxil volume or hematocrit level, and we simply recommend that if an animal is at a FOMACHA score of, of a four or five, then you deworm these animals. If they're a one or two, they're not anemic. Four or five is anemic and require treatment. So you deworm those animals and you leave the rest alone. All right, a three is questionable. And the next slide will talk about some recommendations, specifically as it pertains to a FOMACHA score of three. So again, we typically deworm animals that have scores of four and five. We leave one and twos alone if they're young animals with threes then we generally deworm them and adults with threes in specific situations. So we're going to deworm threes if they're kids or lambs, goats, because they're more susceptible to parasites than sheep are, periparchment females, lactating females, if they have a low body condition scores in the overall herd or flock, if you have a huge percentage of FOMACHA scores of fours or fives, then you'd want to deworm a three. If you have infrequent monitoring, animals can go from a, a, a three to a four or five pretty, pretty fast. And in goats, this can happen faster than in a sheep. So if you know that you're not monitoring at least every two weeks, then you'd want to deworm a three 
because she could slide to a four or five and be pretty bad by the time you get back to check her. And if there's a high parasite challenge, and then do not do worm threes is the opposite of that. Again, we will be providing you with a, a PDF of this presentation so that you can have it to watch. Next, I'm going to show you how to actually do a FAMACHA score. And it's a video that was put up by Dr. Ann Zajak by, um, from Virginia Tech. And I will narrate because I'm not sure if you can hear the, the, the volume of it. So in order to do the FAMACHA, you want to be in direct sunlight. You want to do this not inside your barn. You want to do it inside, outside in the natural sunlight. And it's cover, push, pull, pop. Close that eye, push on it, pull, and it pops out. And you need to have the card right there with you. You're just looking at that mucous membrane and you bring it close and that animal is a two. For March score of a two, that's red. That's a lot of red. You do both eyes on an animal and you deworm, the, you deworm based on that paler eyelid. If one is two and one if it's and one is a three and it's a younger animal you would deworm based on that three okay this is an animal with a different color and so we will look at this one so cover push pull pop and you can see the membrane it is paler than the one from the last animal and that one would be a three. There is some pink. I had a, a, a veterinarian parasitologist tell me once, if you see pink, it's fine. But remember, it all depends on how often you're checking these animals because if a macho score of a three can slide, especially in a goat, it can slide to a four or five faster than, than the much of a three in a sheep. Okay, so some other pointers I want to give for the FAMACHA, FAMACHA system. I mentioned before that you always do it in direct sunlight. You do not do it in your barn. Even if you catch them in the barn, have at least a couple of panels set at the door so you could grab, you could, you could pull them outside and do the FAMACHA score in direct sunlight. If you wear glasses, make sure you're wearing glasses that day too, because the FAMACHA scoring is highly subjective. Right. If you're the one that monitors for matcha score, then you should be that designated person. You shouldn't be switching because it, it can differ. I had a graduate student once who, if it was pale, I would measure it as a three and she would always be at a four. So it is subjective. So the same person should be monitoring it. So in direct sunlight, do not keep your card on your dashboard. It fades. So your card should be kept somewhere secure so that it is not being exposed to direct sunlight and it is not fading. We do FAMACHA checks on both eyes. And as I mentioned before, you go with the paler eye for, for need to deworm. These cards should be replaced every year, every, every 12 months to, to 24 months, depending on usage. So the five point check, moving on to the five point check, and I'm not sure we usually have a lot of questions about what is the five point check. But the five point check essentially addresses limitations of the FAMACHA by determining need for deworming for all internal parasites that affect sheep and goats. So these, the five point check is going to include the FAMACHA um, I score in addition to other clinical signs that animals that are parasitized will show. So the non hemonchus parasites are non barber pole worms will cause a loss of body condition, um, loss of body weight, and will present with, with or can present with diarrhea or scours, as Dr. Whitley mentioned before. So this technique is, or this tool is especially useful when you're deciding whether or not to deworm for matcha scores of threes. Um, it was developed for use in sheep and it involves five checkpoints. So it includes the FAMACHA to check on that mucous membrane. Um, it is checking for bottle jaw in that animal. It is checking their body condition score to check to see if there's been a loss in their body conditions. Um, it checks for that DAG 
a DAG score, which is the degree of fecal soiling. And that one's on a scale of zero to five with zero being clean, but no fecal soiling to fecal soiling all the way down to the hocks. And then the fifth in sheep was the nose. And this is mainly looking for nose bots. And in goats, we replace, the, we replace this for coat condition. So that would be the fifth checkpoint in goats. That's the one that we replace. But using both of, using the five point check as opposed to just using the formatcha, it makes you assess the whole animal. And that's what we want to encourage or want to tell producers to do. It's not just checking eyes and pulling them through, it's looking at the whole animal and determining, you know, whether or not this animal needs to be dewormed. There are folks that advocate for the happy factor, and it, it, it just discriminates between animals that are likely to respond favorably to treatment versus those that are not. So this would also include young animals. We know that all young animals should be growing. If you're weighing your young animals routinely and you put one on the scale and this one isn't putting on weight, then that one, even though it's not showing any other clinical sign than just that, that it's not gaining weight or it's lost, you know, then this animal is one that would be, would probably benefit from being um, dewormed. It results in, in, in less dewormer use and it also maintains productivity. So, so there, there are folks that just look at this, you know your animals best, especially if you have a small farm operation and you know, say you have a sheep named Bella, you know how Bella is every day you go out and feed her um, by the feeder. And if today you go there and Bella is just not herself, she's not eating as much and she's not, not doing well, it's parasite season and you think she could benefit from being dewormed, then you could. Just the recommendation is just not to deworm all animals in a group, all right? We want to be targeted, more targeted in our deworming. Um, so performance indicators for worm control can include weight gain. So I mentioned before, if you, you're weighing your animals routinely to see how they're growing and there are any individuals that are failing to increase in their body weight or they've actually lost body weight, these animals would need to be dewormed. If you're looking at milk yield, you might want to focus deworming on those higher producing dairy females to deworm those. And the same applies for those using those that are raising multiples. You could target them for deworming because lactation takes a lot out of a female. And anything that you could do to help her to deal with that parasite load would help. Also yearlings, body condition, Females in the poorest body condition, if you just target those animals and deworm and leave the rest, that helps you to selectively treat. Fecal egg counts. We generally don't recommend that fecal egg counts be used solely to deworm animals. We recommend that you use it in combination with other clinical signs, looking at their formature, looking at using the five-point check to, to look at that overall animal. Because again, remember I mentioned there are animals that are resilient, that can have a high fecal egg count. It's not affecting them. If they're in a pasture or a paddock where there are young animals that are present, then you would want to deworm that female, even though she's resilient, because she's dropping a lot of parasite eggs and the more susceptible young animals could be picking up those eggs. And I think I covered, I said, what about fecal egg counts? I talked a bit about fecal egg counts before, but the best uses for fecal egg counts are essentially if you want to find out if your pasture is contaminated or not, then you could go through and, and take some random fecal samples. And if the majority of those fecal samples are high, then that generally indicates that that pasture is is infested with parasites. You can use fecal egg counts to determine drug resistance, as Dr. Whitley mentioned before, and also to cull animals. Remember we said fecal egg counts are a true assessment of resistant animals. And if you monitor fecal egg counts during that parasite, during a parasite season, at least two fecal egg counts, then you could use that to choose animals that are parasite resistant. But remember, they have to be challenged. And as I said before, fecal egg counts, it should not be used solely as a deciding factor for treating or not unless it is extremely high and you don't want her distributing all those eggs onto that, that pasture. I want to direct you all to this website, 
I hopefully most of you know this website already, wormx.info. It is the American Consortium for Small Ruminant Parasite Control. And it's a group of um, scientists, veterinarians, extension specialists that we work closely together to, to do research on drug resistance, re research on the most effective treatments and recommendations for using this toolbox that, that we presented to you today. And there's a lot of timely information. We've got fact sheets on best management practices, and we've got timely topics that are put out there on parasite control. And there's a blog and newsletter that's on that website too, that if you're interested to check out this website and check it out frequently so that you can see what the current recommendations are for controlling internal parasites.